your interest in complicated storytelling dovetails with your interest in more sophisticated ways of organizing information with digital tools. This has been an interest of yours ever since uh, you know we were in college together when you were obsessed with HyperCard uh, and later uh, other technologies for writing like Scrivener and others. Uh, you've been interested in, in kind of new ways that technology can help writers tell more complex stories or organize more kind of uh, networked thoughts, I guess you might say. You're now engaged in a new project that is really bringing to fruition this long-held interest. you want to tell us something about that? Yeah, as you said, I mean, it's just from the very beginnings of uh, when I was in college, I, you know, I got a Mac. I, and we're dating ourselves here, but so, I, uh, you know, we arrived in college in 1986 and I got a Mac um, that year and I kind of fell in love with the Mac. And then this program, HyperCard, came out, which was very obscure now. Most people have forgotten about it, but it was kind of a glimpse of the future of hypertext um, before the web had even really been invented at that point. This is 86, 87. And I got obsessed with this idea, like I could use this machine and software to help me organize my ideas and my notes for my classes. And so I built a little application inside of HyperCard that was all about keeping my, I called it curriculum. It was all about keeping my notes from my classes. And I, I got so obsessed with it that I stopped going to my classes. Um, so it kind of was a self-defeating <laughs> invention. But but that just planted the seed. It, it, it stored up floods of light that I, I would later use to illuminate yes. the rest of my, to, to quote Peter Kropotkin. So I, as you said, I went through a bunch of different wonderful tools over the years. I started collecting all, all the quotes from books that I read for research in digital form so that I could search them initially. But so I have the most important passages from books that I've read um, dating back to around 1999. Uh, it's something like 8,000 passages now. I have them on my computer, but now I have them stored in this new project that I've been working on now almost for two years now uh, with Google. And it's called Notebook LM. And it's our attempt to build really this this dream that I've been chasing for, you know, my entire adult life, certainly my professional life of the ideal kind of research and writing tool now made possible finally at long last by the new language models like ChatGPT and, and in Google's case, Gemini. So we've been developing this tool and basically I, you know, I can put in my entire reading history, all those quotes, something like 2 million words of quotes from books. And the second I kind of upload all those quotes, the model is effectively an expert in all that information. And I can say things like, you know, what are some examples of unanticipated consequences in technological history? And it will give me this wonderful kind of crafted, detailed answer with footnotes, like citations directly to the original passages based specifically on my sources, like not based on the general training data that the model has, not, you know, which is prone to hallucinations and all this other, all these other problems, but based on the information that I've given it. And I now am able to use it, and I used it in, in part in, we were developing it as I was writing Infernal Machine. I'm now able to use it as a, as a real like collaborator with what I'm doing and a, an extension of my memory. And so my ability to kind of go in and be like, hey, I just wrote this sentence. What other ideas from the last 25 years of the books that I've read would be relevant to this sentence that I just wrote or this paragraph I'm working on or this sketch I have for an article? And Notebook LM is just extremely good at synthesizing, making connections. It's really fundamentally a kind of a summarization tool in a way and a synthesizing tool. It, you know, it's not pretending to be my buddy. It's not like, you know, it doesn't have a personality, which I love. Like, I just want it to, like, help me organize and connect across all this information. So that's the way we've designed it. And it's it's just been an amazing journey to get to to build this thing that I've been chasing for for my whole life. It's so incredible. And, and it's it really is uh, talk about sort of unlikely narrative developments, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, you've yes. been, you know, you've been maintaining a spark file and talking about slow hunches and the value of writing down your thoughts that may not connect with other ideas, but may find a home in the future. You've had a thesis about you've been collecting favorite passages from books for decades. And I, I, I now have to... Um, I, I have been engaged ever since I've begun to have visibility into what AI is making possible 
in terms of the ability to to um, you know to organize and summon and and assist the writing process and even the thinking process, right? With with access to all this information that is particularly powerful for us. Um, that it, it seems to me that one of one of the effects of this is that we all need to be collecting thoughts and uh, highlighting favorite passages from from things that we yeah. read, right? I, I mean, I mean that it actually like the dividends that uh, are generated from those habits have just become much much more uh, greater. Yeah, and you know what's what's amazing about it is when I first started working on this project, it was it was kind of like, oh, this is going to be incredible search, right? I'm going to be able to do a natural language search and be like, hey, what was what was the name of that cafe where Berkman and Goldman first met? And it was going to be able to understand my question and generate, you know, tell me that it was Saks Cafe in the Lower East Side. Um, but now, as the models have gotten so much more advanced. Um, I'm using it in a, in a very different way. So one of the things I was starting to do, I'm trying to figure out like what the next history book is going to be. And mm. so w one thought I had, which I'm not still not sure about, but like one thought I had was that maybe there's some kind of book I could write a, that was centered around the gold rush in California. And so I read this wonderful book called The Age of Gold, I think it was, um, that came out about 25 years ago and, and uh, you know, highlight a bunch of quotes from that book. And then I loaded them into Notebook LM, which you can do because Notebook does not train the model on your data. So anything that you have that's personal or that you uh, are reading under copyright that you have the rights to because you bought the book, you can put into the model because it, we're just kind of putting that information into the short-term memory of the model, but we're not, there's no way that will become part of the model's overarching training data and be used by anybody else. So that's a very important part of the project. So I put these quotes in there and I'm like, I basically wrote a little query that was, that was basically like, hi, I'm Steven Johnson. <laughs> I write multi-threaded, you know, complex narrative, network narrative, history books like The Ghost Map and The Enemy of All Mankind. I'm thinking about writing a book about the gold rush in that style. Take a look at these quotes that I've just given you. And what do you think? Like, do you, what themes or potential narratives do you see that might be interesting? And it really generates like some very interesting, provocative ideas in a sense, kind of taking my human intelligence of describing what I'm looking for and the kind of book I want to write, the intelligence of the author who wrote this wonderful book about the gold rush and their insights and its ability to kind of go through all these passages and based on its own other outside knowledge of the world to kind of synthesize and, and suggest things and also suggest very specific quotes that I could go back to and use in different ways and stuff like that. And so it really does feel like the beginnings of an intellectual collaboration where mm, the model and right. I are working together on a project and we, we, we think in different ways. I mean, like one of the great lessons, and you've talked about this a lot on, on this podcast with other guests is, you know, when, when people with different kinds of intelligence converge on a problem, they tend to be better problem solvers yes. because they complement each other and, and build on each other and they approach it from different angles. And that is what we're going to start getting now, what we are getting now with these language models and other forms of AI. They aren't human. They aren't intelligent in the way that humans are, but they have already some superhuman skills at summarization and association and other things like that. And so when you when you work in sync with them, and particularly when you ground the model in documents and sources that you trust, I think that magical things can happen now already right out of the gate. I mean, we see them you know, every day with Notebook LM. Can you talk a little bit, Stephen, about how you think about hunches slow hunches, fast hunches, hunches, and clusters of hunches, and how that intersects with Notebook LM and how people can deploy AI. Yeah, and, and where good ideas come from, um, the book I wrote now 14 years ago, one of the opening chapters is a riff about the, the kind of the illusion of the eureka moment, um, the light bulb moment that dominates so much of the discussion of innovation and history of ideas. Everybody loves to tell a story where the apple falls from the tree and he has the theory of gravity. You know, there's like this moment of sudden discovery because yeah. that makes for a good story. But the truth is, if you go back and look at the history of innovation, that it, it almost never really happens like that. And the way that it normally happens is that somebody has a hunch, like a sense of possibility, a sense that there's something 
interesting or puzzling in some field or domain or some business opportunity or whatever it is, creative idea. And they don't really know, they don't really have it in an actionable way or a fully realized way, but there's just a like spidey sense kind of that there's something interesting. And it often stays in that hunch state for months, for years. For I mean, there are some examples of it that I've written about that was like more than a decade of kind of lingering in the back of your mind. And slowly what happens is the hunch, you know, you see something else, you read something else, you have a conversation with someone else and they add a little bit more. It's like, it's a, it's a network that's slowly building out. It's not a single thing. And over time, as you make more connections, the hunch starts to feel like maybe there's something there. And, you know, eventually you think, well, ah, actually I have a book here, or I have an invention here, or I have a startup here. And so part of the lesson is, which you alluded to before, is is to write everything down, you know, or type everything up, uh, whatever whatever preposition you want, um, and capture those hunches because they are the easiest things to forget. Like mm -hmm. you, you, yeah. you know, the first yeah. thing you, everybody has so many things to do, and you know, you've got to manage the kids, or you've got Q one deliverables at your job, or whatever it is, and so that weird little fragment of an idea that you had, like while shaving, <laughs> doesn't linger you know really easily and it's easy to just have it get wiped out of your mind because it's not useful yet but that hunch that you had you know while shaving in 2018 might actually be the seed of a, of a great idea in 2024 because something has changed in the world or your knowledge has changed or the network you're in has changed and so i've always tried to really be rigorous about like writing those down, um, revisiting them, like kind of reading. This is what I call the spark file that you alluded to, just like having the place where you just jot down the kind of crazy ideas. And, you know, when I read through my spark file, like easily a fifth of them, I'm like, how many glasses of wine <laughs> had I had that night when I wrote that? Like, what, is, what does that even mean? You know? Yeah. <laughs> and, but then, you know, every 30 of them, I'm like, that became a book. Like that was the night where right. I first started to think right. about the thing that became a book. And yeah. So that I think that's a it's a wonderful practice. And by the way, you know, you can do that pen and paper with a notepad, but I think that it's now, you know, the payoff of being able to have it in your notebook, in notebook LM or whatever note taking software you use, because now not only can you search it, but now you the AI can help you kind of riff on those ideas and make, you know, your it, its own connections. Um, I think the the payoff of that is so so valuable. Well, this may make the, the writing of your next book that much easier, and <laughs> it may result in more beautiful, complicated uh, tellings of uh, interesting historical moments. So uh, thank you, Stephen, for being with us today. I gathered some light, <laughs> which yeah. I'm going to store. <laughs> yeah, so, thank so, you. So many interesting topics here. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it was, really it was a total delight, Rufus. Thank you. Thank you for having me back.